Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We are proud to produce this webinar series of data governance case studies for the Data Governance Professionals Organization. We would like to thank you for joining today's DGPO, How an Organization Leveraged the Data Debt Concept to Sustain Data Governance, sponsored today by Calibra. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DGPO. Now let me turn the webinar over to Ann from the Data Governance Professionals Organization to introduce today's webinar and give you a brief overview of the DGPO. Great. Thanks, Shannon. And thank you all for everyone who is joining us. We are super excited that you're a part of this. Uh, before we get started with today's presentation, I want to give you a brief overview of what the DGPO is, the Data Governance Professionals Organization, and then I will introduce you to our sponsor, Calibra. So first of all, the DGPO is a community of data governance professionals, and our mission is to share knowledge, content, and best practices with our members to build a better community of practice. Towards that goal, we recognize six core areas that comprise data governance. And you'll see our core logo and graphic are down in the left-hand corner of this slide. And those six areas are fundamentals, organization, process, metrics, communication, and stewardship. As we share content like you'll find in today's webinar, you'll find that we are always looking to make sure we are helping our members grow and develop in these six areas and to broaden our, our data governance knowledge and expertise. In addition to these informative webinars, there are also many other benefits being a DGPO member. To learn more, please visit our dgpo.org website. Now, just a little side note, I just had heard that there might be some issues with that. So please, if you go and you see something that doesn't look right, we are working on it in the background. But please um, do visit as we make sure that comes back up and is online uh, with no problem. With that said, before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to turn it over to Dan Scholler for a word from our sponsor. Well, we're actually having issues getting Dan logged in, so well, so, <laughs> uh, but uh, I know, so we want to do All like right. a, a quick and great shout out to Calibra for sponsoring today's webinar. He will be able to join us for the Q&A at the end, um, so we will just switch it right over to uh, to the presentation. Oh, okay. Well, then I will introduce our presenters today. And like you said, uh, Shannon, we're super excited to have Calibra as a sponsor, and I will look forward to them being a part of, with Dan being a part of the Q&A as well. Um, super excited about today's presenters and to tell you about them, because not only do, have I had some fantastic experience working with both of these folks, um, but special to the DGPO for these guys is they are both advisors to the DGPO board. Um, so they obviously are very highly recognized in the data governance field. Um, they have probably forgotten more about data governance than most of us know. Um, so you are in for a treat today. Um, so first of all, John Ladley is a business technology thought leader, and he's a recognized authority in all aspects of in enterprise information management. He has 35 years of experience in planning, project management, improving IT organizations, and successful implementation of information systems. And he's the president of First San Francisco Partners. John is widely published, co-authoring a well-known data warehouse methodology and a trademark process for data strategy planning. His book, Making EIM Work for Business, A Guide to Understanding Information as an Asset and Data Governance, uh, how to design, or a guide, excuse me, a guide to understanding information as an asset and data governance, how to data design, deploy, and sustain an effective data governance program. Both of those are recognized as authoritative sources in the EIM field. His information management experience is balanced between strategic technology planning, project management, and practical application of technology to business problems. And Gwen Thomas, who is a corporate data advocate for the International Finance Corporation, she is a data governance pioneer, helping to define and analyze, evangelize of the field. Founder of the Data Governance Institute, which many of us are familiar, and a primary author of the framework and guidance materials found at www.datagovernance.com, she has influenced hundreds of programs around the globe. In the spring of 2013, Gwen joined the International Finance Corporation, part of the World Bank Corp Group, as their corporate data advocate. Earlier in her career, Gwen spent a dozen years working in the trenches and in management roles as a systems integration consultant and knowledge manager. Informationmanagement.com has named her one of the 17 women in technology you should be following on Twitter. For what it's worth, she's at symbol Gwen Thomas GGI. 
definitely follow her. There's lots, lots of good information coming from her, her account all the time. And she is included in their, um, she's also included in their data governance gurus list. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to John and Gwen for uh, their fantastic webinar for today. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Anne. And uh, hello, Gwen. And uh, Hello, everyone. Um, I'll start here with some uh, background on uh, data debt. And then Gwen is going to spend uh, a time tile telling her story uh, uh, about this. Um, so well, let's just kind of get into things. But, you know, first, this concept of data debt. Why do we need to talk about it? It, it, it came about as do all these things, necessity being the mother of, of invention, uh, because we still get asked for ROI, for data governance, and that's, we try to do it even though philosophically it's not the type of thing you do an ROI on, but we, we give it a shot anyway. Uh, we still run into uh, obstacles with all the business alignment, and, and uh, we just kind of started to think about there has to be a better way to uh, sell data governance. Um, and and uh, um, as you'll see here in a little while, we took a look at it uh, from a, um, when I started to do use these terms several years ago, I took a look at it from an accounting aspect because that, that actually is my background. A lot of people are surprised to hear that. Um, but anyway, um, uh, uh, we put off data management and data governance a lot because we're not time to kind of deal with anything like that right now. Well, and 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 we all know that at the end of the day, that is a a, 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 a glib argument at best. It, it's hey, John, I'm going to interrupt you just for a second. If you could speak up, I think some people on the webinar are having a hard time hearing you. Oh, really? Okay. Um, yep. There you go. There we go. Hold on a second here. All right. I think my microphone was under my collar. There we go. That's probably. Is that better? That is much better. Thank you. Okay. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, um, but thank you so much. No, that's fine. Um, the next thing is uh, issues of sustainability. We all know that we start these things, and a year later, well, we start them again. Uh, and then last, you know, how do we convey that data management is really important if the traditional ROI stuff doesn't seem to work? So um, uh, um, this stuff does work. It's not a hypothesis. There's many, many examples in place. We're going to hear about one one today, right? You know, it, it, I, you know, you take two fictitious companies here, basically Sprockets and Coxwell Cogs, which um, uh, I like to use because, uh, um, it, you know, as you get older, you reflect on your childhood. And this is Saturday morning for me, right? Anyway, um, really good companies have a strategy in place. They align things with their goals. They align data management, data governance with their goals. And they're act actively managing their risks with data management and data governance. And we are now in, a, in an era where there's dozens of cases and uh, 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 suitable examples of this. But we still have an awful lot of companies that just do things the way they've always done it. They try it, no, we don't do it that way, or we don't do it here at this way. And they, and they get, and they let middle management get away with resistance and things like that. So, so um, the key thing here, it's not a hypothesis. This stuff works, right? It's how do we communicate it? How do we communicate that it works? Uh, we've been struggling with this for a good 20 years now in in our industry. So there's the concept of data debt. Well, what is it? Um, first of all, it is uh, it's kind of two things. Uh, the first way, thing that I started it with is more of a metric. I I, I consider it a way that you can uh, unofficially on a non-balance sheet or notional or pro forma or whatever way you want to say it measure what it's costing you to not do things right with your data. Um, when an organization says, well, uh, we really need to get uh, better data quality because we take too long to gather data and correct it to, to do a report, what they're really saying is it's too expensive because time is money. But no one ever says how expensive it is. They just say it's taking too long. It's relativistic. Well, look, you can measure anything, right? So what is that measurement? So if you can impute what that cost really is, and then you say, I keep spending that money over a period of time, until I do something differently, I'll keep spending that money, which means 
I'm going to always owe something over time. Well, when you owe somebody money over time, that is called borrowing, all right? So, so um, it, we're not making an entry in a data glossary and someone makes up a new word or a new term and we don't have it, or there's an undocumented table put into production, we have increased a, a few, we have incurred a future expense. The other way, and we'll show some examples on how you get there in a minute. The other way here is it's a message. It is a very concise metaphor. You don't have to have a number, but you can say, if we keep doing that, we're gonna to have to pay more in the future to unwind it. And that has turned out to be more powerful of the two aspects of this definition. Uh, I, I like the metrics. I'm known for, for doing a lot of metrics based stuff. Uh, uh, Gwen, as you'll hear shortly, was able to take the metaphor and the message and really evangelize with that and do some really, really neat things. So data debt is a way to express basically what any debt is. You borrow against the future. So therefore, it is a balance sheet type thing. Um, for those of you that uh, have been um, in technology and ran away from accounting classes, um, uh, uh, the financial statements are actually pretty simple in concept. You have a balance sheet and you have an income statement. And the balance sheet is made up of assets on one side and it has to balance with liability and equity on the other. And then of course there's the income statement which is revenue and expenses. But debt is a liability. That means you have to do something in the future. It's important enough an organization has to recognize it's a problem. Now we can have intangible debt on on balance sheets. We don't have intangible data debt yet on balance sheet. But if we were to do that, that's where it would go. That is the type of number or metric or message we're, we're talking about here with, with data debt as a metric. Now, we incur this when we do uh, less than um, correct things around data. Now, now the concept of data debt comes from technical debt, which is which is a well-known uh, concept in the agile development world. And it's pretty simple. If we have to defer a feature, the product manager says, let's defer the feature, but what will it cost us on the next release to get the feature back? And it will cost more because you'll have to uh, retrofit the architecture or the code perhaps. But everyone says yes. We agree to spend more money in the future to defer the fee, to in the future to defer the feature. Well, um, what we do with data is really no different. The inadvertent and reckless is when we do something that will be really expensive to do later. For example, we have a good customer master file from a CRM system from a few years back and someone doesn't like it or has a political issue so they went out they go out and buy a brand new master data management system and load customer into that too you now have a future uh problem of having to put those two together it is it, it and it's done with ignorance because it's usually done by one part of an organization that has obtained some political power but has not been educated to consider think about data then there's the deliberate and reckless type of activity. You know that's not the best way, um, but you feel like you've got to, got to do ready, fire, aim, um, and you just go ahead and do it anyway. I think that's where most organizations are now because everyone says, we'll fix it later. And we all know that um, uh, 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 later never, never, never happens, right? Um, it, it just never comes back around to happen. You just, uh, I guess another way to look at this, well, it's a topic I can explore later in the year maybe is data karma because you bad, you built some real bad data karma if you um, uh, make these types of decisions. Now, the third thing is we've learned from it and we are now getting smarter about it and people might bring to the table that we're really concerned that if we do this project, it's going to create some, some data debt um, um, and, you, it, and um, you are being prudent about it uh, and you're thinking about it, but then you still go ahead and do it. You haven't really completed your, your knowledge about that. I don't think that happens very much. Of course, the ideal situation um, is even if you do incur data debt, you acknowledge it, 
you record it, you know the cost, and you make an allowance to maybe take care of it in the future, or you just accept it, and management accepts the consequences. Now, some of you out there are going, well, that's, that's bad. It actually isn't bad. Um, this is actually, in my experience, Gwen will bring another experience here, but in my experience, what happens is um, uh, an organization gets ed educated, and that means educating leadership to a point where, where they know they're doing something incorrect and they are incurring data debt, and they start to hesitate that, um, or they start to allow for correcting it. Uh, and it be, makes it more aware. Um, maybe it's just feeling guilty when they leave the office at the end of the day. I don't know, but it is actually that is a good thing uh, to happen. Um, it's a negative asset. It is a liability, all right? When you enter data into a spreadsheet, instead of uh, talking to your data management people and you departmentally do something, or you're a data person listening to this webinar, and you know of people doing this, um, it's perfectly fair at this juncture and our level of knowledge to tell them, you have recklessly obligated our organization to fix this in the future because you're building a mission critical spreadsheet. You have obligated us to some debt. That is a perfectly appropriate thing to say. Um, if there's a perceived crisis, then, um, you 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 think there's no time to design and you dive right in, but you know in 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 reality, there's always time to do a little design, right? That's just that's just emotions entering to into it. Uh, we learn our lessons when we have done something inadvertently. Then we take a prudent look and say, well, oh, we don't want to do that next time. But the last thing, the upper right hand corner, is business conditions require we incur the debt but we're going to figure out what we can tolerate and what we can't tolerate and make, make and take the steps to, to address that. So some, some symptoms on how this will arise here is um, cleaning up poor uh, data quality. Um, misaligning BI, I think the BI misalignment, if I were to measure, and I have done metrics on this, that's the biggest number I get. Um, most organizations have no idea what they spend on business intelligence. They say there's a budget for the data warehouse department or the analytics or the data scientists or whatever, but they don't ever take into account the handful of business analysts and data analysts in every department, the local tools, the local spend, the time spent cleansing data and moving data around, uh, things like that. And when you add all those together, it becomes becomes a rather enormous number, and you're obligated to pay that until you fix it. And some organizations actually have no idea it's so much money. They believe that is business as usual now, and that really isn't uh, the case. Um, there's a cost of not being able to count how many customers you have or products or what you've shipped, just real simple counts because of data inconsistencies. Um, and that cost will continue. And again, if you have recurring costs over time, you're basically incurring that. Um, uh, departmental accesses and spending in acquiring outside services, uh, external data sources, all of those things. So you have ignorance debt, selfish debt, immature debt, that's all bad karma. And then you have acknowledged debt. Uh, you know, at least we're going to do something when we deal with it in the future. The key here is that you are accumulating interest. The longer you allow this to happen, at first you say, well, I can't do data governance or I can't do data management and we're still doing this and that's dumb. But it's worse than that. It's not just dumb. It's getting really, really, really horribly expensive. I know of two organizations in the last three years of my uh, practice that debt, data debt, ground them down to the point where one declared bankruptcy, another one had to be acquired. They could not operate anymore. The data debt overwhelmed them. They didn't call it that, but that's exactly what happened. So this is a message that a business will embrace. Even if we can't do the metric or take the time, this is a really good metric. Uh, just a couple of scenarios to lock this down for everybody. Um, small company decides to assume risk around GDPR, which is happening everywhere by now. May 25th has come and gone. I can guarantee you, I've been in the room, Organizations have said, well, it's going to cost us $20 million to get compliant. 
Uh, we don't think the fines in our industry will be the full 4%. So even if it's 50 million, yeah, you know what? We're going to take the risk or we're going to meet it in the middle halfway. All right. That's data debt. Um, uh, there, there are data scientists out there who, who just really want to run their model and they know the model isn't perfect. And they run it anyway. And then they say, well, it's not quite perfect, but here's what you can use it for. And people use it for it anyway. The model runs and runs and runs, and it's a deficient model, but it's still used in a uh, less than uh, um, optimal uh, manner. Um, uh, a lot of you out there are in government, and, there, and a common refrain that uh, we all hear, Anne, Shannon, uh, myself, um, all that. I see that uh, Dan is on now. He has heard this, too. Um, good heavens, I've worked with everybody on this call. Dan's on now, too. Um, that uh, public entities themselves, they, 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 the traditional ROI doesn't help with them, but data debt is a powerful metric for a public entity because if you've got to spend something in the future to fix it, that's another budget. You are pre-allocating budget dollars that you don't want to allocate, right? So you are putting yourself into a, a politically uh, uh, um, uh, less a political position that is not where you really want to be. So um, plus the cost of not doing anything uh, becomes a real problem in those types of organizations as well. So at that point, I am going to turn this over to uh, Gwen Thomas, and she's going to tell you a story of how this stuff works. Over to you, Gwen. Thank you, John. You don't need to stay on this page. They all know who I am. <laughs> Great. So let me tell you uh, our story. It actually started before we heard the term data debt and um, then continues from there. Um, in our case, as, as John has said, and, and by our, I mean the IFC, which is the private sector um, arm of the World Bank Group. In our case, the metaphor itself was powerful enough to become the tipping point for um, commitment to certain resources, um, uh, funding, and actions um, of the type that are fairly universal. So I'm going to talk about those, those universal situations and how we were able to leverage this concept to get there. Um, our culture is, is one that um, if the case is strong enough anecdotally, then it isn't always necessary to, to gather the metrics. So I'm not going to really be talking a lot about um, hard and fast metrics, but more about how we use this concept to move our program forward. So I can only talk about up to five years ago because that's when I joined the IFC. And at that point, our organization, just like most of the world, um, was looking at their customer records. They were looking at capabilities that we had, excuse me, and uh, a decision had been made just about the time I came on board to start looking at uh, MDM. Now, why were we looking at it? At this point, again, we were not using the term data debt. But we did know that because of legacy systems, legacy processes, we had some duplicate records. Okay, us and the whole world, right? Um, the technical teams weren't sure uh, about how to source data because of, of this and some missing documentation. So that meant everything was more expensive, right? Everything took longer if we were working with our customer data. And because these issues had not been resolved, that meant that there were challenges with a certain analysis, the same sort of thing everyone has to do. What are our um, 
obligations to certain clients? What are our, um, uh, what are their obligations to us? If you have uh, 17 versions of uh, Citibank in Manhattan, then that can make, uh, make it a little bit challenging. Here's what became really interesting as we looked into why that had happened, why we were in the situation we were in. And it turns out that strong data quality controls had been built into the system that, um, in, into which we entered our customer records. However, there was a performance issue, and so they were disabled. And as John was saying, we're always going to fix it right away, right? Well, they didn't get fixed right away. And so it became easy for staff who were entering uh, customer records to create duplicates or to not have, have quality steps in place. So. Um, let's see, John, on your one, two, three, four category, um, here's one of the reasons we don't point backwards too much because we could get into um, a, uh, a big debate whether that was reckless and inadvertent or reckless and deliberate about not including those controls. Right. And of course, Whenever you have a situation like that, when there is an argument between the data experts and others, um, often it is because the consequences of actions are not communicated in a way that everyone can understand. So that's obviously what had happened to us low so many years ago. And as a result, this analysis had been done and there was now an understanding that there were gaps in controls and there had been every project that dealt with this data took extra time, extra money, and because of lack of documentation about data, which is a type of data debt, um, additional inadvertent decisions were made so that there might be more duplicates, there might be um, missed opportunities to streamline. So we, just like a lot of the world, made the decision to undergo a master data management program to clean up our customer data, standardize it, put um, a governance around it, capture robust metadata definitions. This was a very important project for the company. It was considered central to many efforts. It cost way more than anyone wanted to spend on it, but the understanding was, well, we don't really have a choice. Uh, we spend it now or, we'll, or we can't do certain things that we want to do and the price tag will just go up. Boy, I wish that we had used the concept of data debt during those discussions. I wish I had been able to turn to the CIO and say, yes, of course our BI processes are too expensive because a simple report has to build in certain cleansing activities and you could consider that interest being paid on this previous project. So in a way, this was our control situation. I could look at the teams and how they communicated with each other without this term and see where um, it was steady sailing to move forward and, and where we, there was lack of understanding. Let's go to the next case study, John. Event slide? Oh, there we are. <laughs> so um, with generally the same players, a year or two later, we were looking at 
changing the way we did uh, our data dictionaries and, and data glossaries. And uh, we actually had a robust glossary, and it was pretty well used, um, especially for business terms that were um, used in our BI environments and others. But we didn't have as much technical metadata, and we were looking for opportunities to put this all together. Having been through the um, debate with the customer master data, now we had some language to discuss uh, why it was worthwhile to start uh, to spend some money and give attention to updating something. It wasn't broken, but it also wasn't adequate for future needs. So leadership understood that projects took too long. We had added costs, mistakes are made, um, there's misunderstanding of the data, but we weren't really quite at the tipping point for deciding to spend the money on this. And then, our CIO moved on to uh, another executive rotation, and we got a new CIO. And she said, hmm, I don't know as much about working with data and governing data as I'd like to. Gwen and Jennifer, do you have any suggestions? And we said, what do you know? We're going to a data governance conference in uh, New Jersey in a couple of weeks, why don't you come with us? Well, bless her, she, she cleared two and a half days from her schedule and came at, into this immersive uh, experience with us. And one of the sessions was with John, my friend John Ladley. And in rather an offhand way, just before he started talking, he came over to where we were sitting. I got to introduce him, and, and I asked him if there was something new he was talking about, and he said, oh, the concept of data debt. And I said, oh, that, that's good, and, and we shared another sentence or two about it. Then he stepped away to get ready. Well, my, my CIO turned to me and said, explain to me about this data debt. Now, it's wonderful. We're a financial institution. If you're in leadership here, you understand money. So I gave her the, the short version, and she said, what would that apply to? And I said, well, we just spent blah, 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 blah amount of money on MDM to pay off a data debt because we, we, um, we did not put in a very simple set of controls because of performance, and so instead of spending a small amount of money to fix the performance issues, in the 15 years since then, we've been spending more than that every year as interest on not having quality data, and to clean it up, we spent this huge amount, and she said, oh. I get that. Oh, oh, that's a good concept. I get that. I wish we'd been able to explain it that way. I said, okay, well, let me tell you about the next topic that's coming towards you, and that is the glossary. So here is our situation, and what, and you can imagine what having X but not having Y does to the cost of resources when we have to do the following types of work. She says, oh, you mean they don't have a tech technical dictionary with blah, 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 blah to do this? And I said, well, I, this is before my time, but I was told we had it at one time, and something happened that it went away, I don't know, a couple of contracts firms ago, so I, I couldn't speak to that, but the shorter answer is no, we don't have it. And so you could say we've been paying a lot of interest, a lot of data debt on not having that. And she turned to me and made the most adorable face and said, 
oh my gosh, Gwen, are we data bankrupt? <laughs> and Jennifer and I laughed and said, no, 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 we are not bankrupt, but we have been paying a lot of debt on, on this. And so we're hoping that under your tenure as, as CIO, we'll be able to um, start paying down that debt and, and perhaps avoiding future debt. Um, and she said, okay, we're going back and on Monday, I am going to issue instructions to all of my management team. When it comes to data definitions, no new data debt, period. I said, oh, that's fantastic. Thank you, she said, well, it only makes sense. So we're going to say that a project is not complete until all of the terms make it into the dictionary. And if you have a project that works with data, we expect you to go through inventory, the glossary, and if there's any existing debt, I want you to pay it down, build it into your project plan. I said, okay, great, you know, you're gonna get some pushback on this, but I think that's the right thing to do and I'm grateful for it. And she said, good, good, because I'm not gonna back down on it. And I sat in meetings with her where she told project managers, if you have not budgeted for this work already, it's not that this is new cost, it's that you under budgeted to do this work. So um, this was, what, three and a half years ago, and the no new data debt uh, ruling has absolutely stood since then. And it gave us a way of discussing um, the situation without throwing fingers back and forth, without getting into the was it deliberate or was it uh, inadvertent, who knew what, who made what decisions. We could just say, all right, well, the fact is the debt exists. And then she said, okay. So we now are going to have data debt discussions included in our annual planning. So every project that comes through, Gwen, I want you to ask them, um, can you ask a, a handful of questions that would indicate whether they are taking debt into account? And I said, oh yes, yes we can. So the data team got involved in not only annual planning, where we would look at um, whether data is being appropriately treated in the capital budget and, and one-time admin, but also pointing out uh, the impact on, on future maintenance costs. We also got a seat at the table for reviewing all projects that go through um, the IT governance uh, process to actually kick off the projects and, and get the funding that had been um, given to them. Now I have to say, this absolutely falls under the category of be careful what you wish for. That work is, um, that's something that everyone should have to do sometime in their life in their data career, so just like everyone should work fast food, so you so you understand uh, how it goes. But it's it's um, it was not as much fun as some of the other stuff. But you know what was fun? As we were discussing throughout all of our processes, now what about the data? What about the data? Um, now we were able to introduce just good solid data management and governance discussions with the audiences that might not have been included in them otherwise. So we could say, what are you doing about ensuring the quality? What are you doing about controls? What are you doing uh, uh, about this or that and the other? And if we got pushback, we would, the answer would be, well, you know, you don't really get to push back on security there are certain things you can't opt out of. And 
our CIO has decided that there are certain data-related things you can't just opt out of either. So that led us to deeper and richer conversations and uh, planning and strategy. And a theme kept coming up, and that had to do with access control, access government, access management, if you would move the slide down. So we discovered that not only did we have some natural, inevitable data debt in this other area, but we, just like most of the world, we're going to have to move into a new house. We had to get a bigger place. Sometimes the existing structures just aren't adequate for what's coming forward if, you've, if you're dealing with privacy, if you're dealing with, um, uh, especially in our case, changes in our business model. Many of our systems, and again, I'm not saying anything out of school here, but many of our systems, our, our older ones, were built under the assumption that we would have almost entirely internal workforce, very few consultants or, or contractors. Therefore, if you made it into the system, then chances are professional discipline would be strong enough uh, for what you could view, what you could act on, and perhaps I didn't need to prevent you from taking certain actions. You knew it wasn't uh, um, your job to do that, so, so we were okay. But with changes in business models come, um, comes the need to expand who can see what, and we really, really needed some fine grain access. So we started exploring um, what our options were, uh, and this is this amazing effort I'm, I'm in up to my ears with right now. We decided to leapfrog several generations and do some really strong cutting edge stuff. And so in our case, this concept was so necessary to describe that because when we would talk about the activities that needed to be done um, and the cost and the attention that would take to it, uh, we were able to divide into, well, this is existing data debt. You know, everyone knows you have to have groups of people and group management, but come on guys, there's this last little piece that's still in Lotus Notes Hello, we got to move away from that. Okay, so that's paying down an existing data debt. But then we also want to take on these brand new capabilities that we didn't have before. Oh, that's a new mortgage. All right. So we were able to break down a, an extremely complicated work program in a way that would allow the various teams that would work together and take on some of this burden to understand um, what role they were playing. And quite frankly, I, I'm not sure that we would have been able to move forward with this uh, complicated uh, an effort if we had not gotten the seat at the table before, trained people to start thinking about what's going through the pipes and the pumps and the filters and not just the technology that is those pipes and pumps. Um, and frankly, the term data debt just really, really helped us um, sell it. So uh, that's sort of an evolution from our perspective of how just a metaphor can really help us work within our unique culture and our unique environment to bring um, labels to work that non-technical staff and even sometimes technical staff wouldn't really understand. We could, we could say, okay, well, for this effort, 
about a third of it is paying down existing data debt. Uh, about a third of it is updating our rules, and about a third of it is taking out this mortgage for our, our new capabilities, um, which come along with the promise of using good data practices to not invoke future data debt with that. So did you have some um, other words you wanted to say, John, about this before we took questions? I'm just going to kind of just wrap up. Uh, you know, we've, we've done some, here's a, a quantitative example, Gwen uh, uh, very eloquently uh, talks about the, the messaging is powerful, but you know, you can do this pretty easily. Here's some real quick things here. Just uh, someone wants to do some funding in some other area and another division wants to do something that might help the same way and the CIO wants to do something like that and everyone defers the CIO doing data governance and data management to synchronize up the other two projects. Uh, and so you've uh, kicked aside that study and it's just really easy to say you've just at least minimally put one and a half million dollars uh, uh, against the future. Um, so there's that. that. Um, uh, the real key here is, is how do you defend what you're doing with data governance, what you're doing with EIM? And, and um, we always get these questions. We need better data, just get started. Give us all the data. Who hasn't heard that? You know, data scientists don't need data management. I mean, we still hear that occasionally where they say, look, you know, our algorithms will be superb and we'll overcome all data issues, and which is, which is uh, um, not correct. Um, uh, business gets all the benefits, IT is a service, so you really don't have any say in all of this. All of this, this is a way to respond to all of those now that we've been struggling for for years and years uh, and years. Uh, at that point, we can now go to our uh, questions and answers, and and uh, we'll turn it uh, over to you now. And uh, um, uh, I'm unmuted. Gwen's unmuted. Um, we can get Daniel in on this, and uh, we'll go from there. We have a lot of questions coming in. It looks like we do. We've had a ton of questions. So, um, are we okay to just jump right into them? Jump Sound right good? In. Yeah. All right. Um, so, first of all, John, you talked about two companies that you know that struggled slash went, went data bankrupt. Um, and this person is looking specifically, are there simple and easy to understand public stories that demonstrate the importance of data governance? And following on, they kind of said, you know, Cambridge Analytica was one that was kind of an obvious one. So, do you have any that were, yeah. were or something you would suggest them to kind of turn to to look for that kind of obvious? Well, the Cambridge Analytics is, is really focuses on kind of what Gwen's working on now, and that's the, the uh, related to privacy and security and ethical uses of, of data. And that's a whole brand new form of data that, that I hadn't even considered when I started to talk about this three or four years ago. Um, so um, that's a whole, that's a new one. Um, I would say if you, it, it, companies don't publicly admit this but if you take a look at take a look at any insurance company or bank that in the last recession, which was the 2007 2008 recession, went under because they didn't have an awareness of their exposure, um, I can say uh, um, uh, one of the really large investment houses that went bankrupt as soon as the derivative thing hit bottom, um, and I forget their name for some reason right now. Uh, I had actually been asked to propose a system to track derivatives for them. And we pitched it and we told them it was the company I was working with at the time. It was uh, 14 or $15 million for a small data management system with data governance to control all of these, all this uh, derivative data coming in. And it was 5 million of tech and 10 million of data governance and procedural changes. Uh, uh, and they exploded. They said it's far too much money. We're gonna we're doing it on spreadsheets. That will be perfectly adequate for now. Um, um, uh, and you know, three months later, uh, the world was different on a Monday morning when uh, this this uh, um, company collapsed over the weekend. Um, so there's one specifically that you can look up a public name, and it was entirely tied to data. It, absolutely 100% was data. Most of the recession was was the fault of bad data management. 
So there's a lot of public examples out there. And I also recommend Doug Laney's book, Infonomics. He has several good examples in that book as well, for that are that are public book as well. Okay. Yeah, and I think you know you're so so on point of it's not even it's not all data's fault, right? There's some of those a lot of that's the policy people and procedure that are around it. Um, uh, oh, and yeah. you guys <laughs> note too, I'm not gonna hit everything that's in chat because there's a lot of good information flowing around in the chat bar as well. Um, but since that's participants kind of going back and forth, if you guys want to pay attention to what they're saying, um, but I want to hit some more of these questions um, that you guys have asked as well. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next one, uh, which is, do you have actual dollar figures that you calculated for the debt, or would you say it's more qualitative or all qualitative? So in our case, it was qualitative, uh, but different cultures are are different. So John, you could answer that. and. Uh, also, we have a request for you to go back a slide, if you don't back, mind doing that. Back a slide. That one? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, we can do that. Um, yeah, this is, this is all kind of rationale for using the concept of data debt here. Uh, mm -hmm. Mostly it's we, we uh, a state of people, when we get pegged into a corner by an executive, we fold and, and run because we're just not trained to, to, to stand up to that. It's no no deficiency on our part. Um, but now you've got something. So, you know, stick your chest out, put your chin up and tell them data debt. Anyway, uh, to answer <laughs> the question, quantitative things, um, I have done it on a pro forma for a number of companies uh, just as an experiment to see what numbers we came up with. Um, uh, for example, uh, we had one company where there was uh, a product, uh, they had to massage product data. They had, they had a product master file, which was okay, but then they brought up a website because they went into e-commerce a little late in the game. Uh, they did it on themselves, they did it themselves, or they pushed it to a service and they didn't push very good quality data out and their website was horrible. Um, so then they hired a bunch of people to manually correct the data every night. Well, okay, as long as those people are working and you are manually changing the names of products or manually changing the, the, the unit of measures or the stock keeping unit number, you, you could fix that, right? So every year you pay that money is money that you're borrowing against uh, the future. So that is the amount of debt we said. Uh, you can fix that or you can pay this. Um, it's up to you. Uh, they elected to go ahead with a different uh, product information management system to, to fix that as a result. But, of, but uh, sometimes you do number. make the decision to continue as you are. And it's just useful to make an informed decision. Absolutely. That's the other thing. A lot of people, uh, they give up. They just say, well, we can't do data governance this year. We can't do it this year, and I go, oh, darn, and then it goes back. Well, it, no, I say, fine, let's just record what we're still spending on this stuff, and and then next year when it's time for strategic planning and alignment, say, no, last year we didn't do this. In the meantime, we spent this much money on fixing bad invoices for customers. We spent this much money on doing this. And we will continue to do that. And if I if I do a net present value, I know that's a financial number, but that's a metric, a net present value of that outflow of cash now for the next five years, and I take my internal rate of return, and some of you have glazed over, I'm sorry, but that is the amount of the debt. And that is a bona fide financial analytical number right there. And we've mm -hmm. done that a few times too. Um, but then you say, Yo, or you can continue to just borrow the money. Look, we all borrow money. I, I want that car now. <laughs> we borrow the money. And we get that car now, and we, and we we spend twice as much for the car as the showroom price. But we want it now. And maybe someone needs to do that. But at least you know what you're spending. That is spot on, Gwen. That is probably a, a, a premier use of this, of this concept. And I think it's yeah. useful for us to point out that we've been moving back and forth in this conversation between data management, um, uh, strategy and accounting, and data governance. And in the case of, of uh, some of our control deficiencies or old technologies, maybe that's just data management and, and we've got debt with that. 
in some of the uh, cases that lead to data disasters, it's really a governance deficiency, keeping in mind that governance starts with decision rights. Who gets to make the decision? So you could manage your data the best in the world, but you have, if you have made a decision to use faulty models, then that is a governance decision that's going to have mm -hmm. impact. So um, it, I know in some organizations there appears to be a very clear line of demarcation between governance activities and data management activities and even technical and, and data strategy activities. But at a certain point you have to look at this holistically. Yeah, yeah. I thought I heard maybe Dan try and uh, to weigh in here. Yeah, I had a, actually, um, hey. I had sort of a, hey, how are you? Uh, this is Dan Scholler with Calibra, by the way. We're happy to sponsor this webinar. I'm so glad you guys could join us. Um, I just wanted to, you know, one of the things you just touched on, which I thought was interesting, was, you know, you said data management and data governance. I guess, you know, coming from kind of an IT background like I do, I think of that first thing as an aspect of technical debt. Right. And there's a there's a lot of, you know, strategy that people have had about how to manage technical data, you know, in terms of allocating, you know, I mean, the, the, the bottom line is you wind up having to allocate some money every year to retire some of your debt. Right. That's, you know, you're not going to do it all at once, but you're going to keep making decisions about what to retire and, and, and keep moving it forward. I think what we've observed with a lot of organizations is the the way that the governance part of that is done doesn't have that, you know, there's no IT budget to allocate money from. You know, it's something that's done kind of on a ad hoc basis as different projects or different initiatives get done off the, you know, come off the ground. And so that's probably, I would imagine, I mean, Gwen, you can tell me if this is correct, but I'd imagine that might have been the more challenging part is, you know, when you figure out where are we falling down, you know, how do we get the, you know, we may figure out that it's in the technology that we're doing, you know, we're storing that stuff in Lotus Notes, as you said. Right. That one, I think we can get our arms around. Um, I hope how do you deal with that, it? With the, yeah. I hope and pray that auditing firms take a close look at uh, how they categorize data work, because when it's always categorized as admin instead of capitalizable, it, yeah. it ties a lot of hands. And That's sorry good. to anyone whose who's eyes glazed over there, but... Um, <laughs> To, the point here is every organization has different buckets of money, and um, uh, there's an awful lot of not me, hot potato, going with uh, around with the data cleanup work. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, I'm going to um, use that as a segue to another question, just because there's, there's a ton of questions we're not going to get to, and hopefully we'll be able to have a chance for you guys to follow on with these questions, um, but a lot of these are, are very related, but there's one that kind of stands out that we see a lot in other topics, which is the who piece of this. And so it's not just about the who's going to do the cleanup, but this particular question is, okay, so who should own this data debt balance sheet? Should it be finance? Should it be IT? Should it, you know, who do you guys think that um, should have this ownership? When, when I'll defer to the accountant. <laughs> Um, uh, data governance, because this is this is business alignment and data governance. One of the key capabilities, uh, I, I feel, uh, the, in a data governance area is is business alignment, and then that means you know helping the business keep its balance sheet clean, whether it's pro forma or or real. Um, the, uh, I'll ask Dan to weigh in here. Dan, have you uh, any thoughts on on that one? That's where I think it should go, but maybe you've seen. Uh, in your in your business, and you know the, the view you have uh, as a provider of product and service, uh, maybe you've seen something different. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, I think I, I, the answer is, is exactly what you said. Obviously, the challenge industry wide is that the ownership of data governance is not always clear, right? Um, you know, if there is a, a data owning organization like a chief data officer, then it often resides there. Um, but even that, you know, there are activities around governing the data 
that, you know, for example, the marketing organization may think they own about governing, you know, prospect and customer data, for example, or things like that. Um, and that's where, you know, th that's where uh, the, the clearly there, there needs to be a central point where you consolidate all of that information to get a view of what your debt is and what the opportunity cost is. I mean, that's the other piece of this, right? You know, it's the same way that you have with like, you know, if you have too many credit card bills, you can't go out and buy that new car. You know, if you, if you have a lot of debt going on, then you can't use the data to create new value because you just don't have the resources. And I think that's the, you know, to, to be able to draw that picture, even if it's not, you know, down to the penny, um, you know, that, that's a tremendously powerful tool and it's, it's got to be done on a large enough, in a large enough scope that people can understand it. Um, so, you know, where we've seen it done, where, where organizations have done this kind of thing effectively, generally there has been some piece of the organization whose primary job responsibility is to make sure that we, they get value out of their data, uh, whether that's a chief data officer or something else. And those are the people who own that concept of the value of the data and the debt associated with using it. Okay. Shannon, I know that we are right at the top of the hour, so um, there's some other great questions, but I don't know that we really have time to address them here. Um, I think I need to pass it back over to you at this point. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, uh, John and Gwen, for this great presentation, and thank you, Dan, and thanks to Calibra for sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, just a reminder that the recording and the slides will be published to the DGPO members only section of their website and we, within the next week. Thanks everybody for being so engaged in everything we do and thanks uh, for attending the webinar. We hope to see you in the next webinar next month. Thanks all. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye-bye.